Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So we can move on to the next slide. So as always, we like to do a little housekeeping. So um, in a few moments here, when I turn things over to Dr. Friedman and the panel, we'll ask everyone to mute themselves and I will be pinning our presenters to the screen so you'll be able to see them. But in the meantime, we have a great group today and I see a lot of new faces. So I would love if everyone could please share your name and the organization you represent or the, the group or community you represent um, in the chat box so we can kind of see who's in the room. And feel free to say hello to your friends and neighbors as you go. All right. And then since I did see this um, this month that we have quite a quite a few new folks joining us, I did want to take a moment to just share a little bit about the Sweatland Center. So if you're not familiar with the Sweatland Center, our mission is to study the complex interplay between environmental determinants and population health outcomes. Our center places special emphasis on community engaged approaches that address the role of structuralism in creating and sustaining environmental health inequities. And we seek to translate these findings into policies, practices, and relationships that promote community and population health equity. And if you look to the right of your screen here, you'll see uh, this uh, little triangle that kind of demonstrates our core areas of focus. So on the outside of the triangle, we're really focused on training and education, community and engagement, and research. So that's just a little bit about us. But if you're interested in learning more, definitely um, check out our website or reach out to us. And we're happy to connect. And we can go ahead to the next slide. Now, some of you who have attended our seminars before know that in 2022, in December, we put out a survey just to learn a little bit more about the experience that our attendees had. So on the right hand side here, I just wanted to share a little bit about what folks said they came to our seminars for. And I thought it was um, very interesting to hear that the number one reason folks attended our seminars is that they wanted to learn more about the environmental influences on population health. Um, also a shared learning about community engaged approaches to environmental health, which aligns with our core areas of focus as a center, as well as co-learning with others committed to addressing the role of structural racism as a determinant of environmental health. So hopefully we can continue to live up to those goals that you have for your time with us when we're in seminars. Um, and on the left-hand side, our little word cloud here is just a summary of what participants said was one word to describe their experiences at the Spelman seminar. So um, lots of good words there, but I was excited to see words like illuminating, enlightening, inspired. So we will continue to take the feedback from those surveys and incorporate those into future iterations of our seminar series. So I appreciate everyone who took the time to fill that out and give us your feedback if it matters to us. And we go to the next slide. I also wanted to remind folks, if, again, if you're not familiar with our events, what we have upcoming. So on the left-hand side, we have a screenshot of our flyer for our Nourishing Power Networking event that is in person here in Cleveland on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023 at the Pivot Center, which is on West 25th Street in the Clark Fult neighborhood of Cleveland. Um, so this will be a space for food justice advocates to come together, network, co-learn in much of the same uh, vein that we're doing right now. Um, but we hope you can attend. I will be putting links into the chat for both the networking event and then our April 2023 seminar, which will be virtual. And so we'll be joined by Drs. Maeve McMurdo, Dr. Karen Malloy, and Dr. Jacqueline Curtis, who are all our faculty affiliates. Um, the title of their their talk is, It Could Make Us Sick, Mapping Occupational Air Pollution Exposure Experienced by Farm Workers in Ohio. So it should be a pretty interesting uh, seminar. And with that being said, I think we're going to turn things over to Dr. Pittman and our panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I think you're in for a really exciting presentation. And in many ways, um, this is a reflection of a long-term relationship that we at the Sweatland Center have had with Ohio State University SNAP-Ed and Ohio Produce Kirks. 
Uh, we've had a great opportunity to work with both of these statewide organizations that are doing on the ground work to support healthy food access, nutrition equity in communities across Ohio. So before I begin, I do want to give um, thanks and gratitude to Pat Bebo and Ana Claudia Zubieta from Ohio State University SNAP Ed and to Anna Bird from Produce Perks Midwest who have been our longtime partners. Again, um, we've been working together for eight years and uh, I think what you'll see today is a testament to what can happen when you partner uh, academic research universities with community uh, focused organizations to uh, make a difference in the real world. So I serve as the director of the Swetland Center. I'm also a professor in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And I've had the opportunity to be the principal investigator for our partnership with SNAP-Ed evaluation work, as well as with our statewide evaluation of Produce Perks Midwest, which is our statewide incentive program. Today, I would like to introduce you to our three or four main panelists. Um, and then I will turn it over to my colleague, Katie, who will take it from there. So Megan Riley is a PSE specialist. And Megan, if you want to wave um, so people can see you, a policy system environmental specialist at the Ohio State University SNAP Ed program. Megan has her master's degree in public health and has worked as a practitioner for 11 years. She provides training and support for planning and implementing collaborative PSE interventions focused on creating access to nutritious food and active living for Ohioans who receive or are eligible to receive SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits. Megan has three years of experience with the PSE Ready that you'll hear more about today and training practitioners on application use in local communities in Ohio. Dr. Awusawa Yamoa is a research scientist in the Community Engaged Research Lead at Case Western Reserve University Swetland Center. She holds a PhD in Spatially Integrated Social Sciences from the University of Toledo. As a social spatial scientist, Dr. Yamoa has concentrated her research efforts on the intersection of health and place, specifically as it applies to healthy food access by leveraging the experiences of low resource communities to inform policy system and environmental changes. She is currently the principal investigator for the Emergency Food Assistance and Food Security Study and the co-investigator for the Nourishing Neighborhoods Empowering Communities Study. Next, we have Callie Oglin Han, who is a third year PhD student studying epidemiology and biostatistics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Her research interests include community-engaged mixed methods research, and she's been working with the Swetland Center for two years. And lastly, Jillian Schulte joined the community nutrition research team at, at the Swetland Center as a graduate research assistant in 2020. She's a fourth-year PhD student studying medical anthropology and public health at Case. Their research interests include refugee healthcare access, patient provider, a community health worker, care models, and connections between culture and health. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Katie Poppy, the manager of the Community Nutrition Research Program within the Swetland Center. Thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Um, hello, everyone. Like Darcy said, I am the, um, I'm a research associate at the Swetland Center. Um, and I'm the project manager for our community nutrition research projects, um, including the tools that we're going to share with you today. Um, so before I pass it over to um, my colleagues to share about our projects, um, we'd like to get a sense of who is here and your areas of work. Um, so Rachel is going to put a poll um, up. So please respond to that poll um, and share your um, the areas that you work in. So we have um, farmers markets healthy food retail, um, healthy eating and food pantries, and nutrition incentive programs, healthy eating and child care, um, uh, sorry, healthy eating and early childhood education, farm to school, um, healthy eating in K through 12 schools or others. So please share. All right, and while um, I'll give everyone a moment to respond to the poll, um, but while you're responding, I'm going to go ahead and um, just set us up today with the big picture why. 
um, behind the project that we're going to share with you today. Um, so as you already know, um, many people, especially those in marginalized communities, are often disproportionately food insecure um, and have less access to healthy food options. Um, so the projects that we're going to share with you today have an overarching and transformative goal of tackling these problems and working toward nutrition equity. Um, and we define nutrition equity, which you can see here on the slide, um, as a state of having freedom, agency, and dignity in food traditions resulting in people and communities that are healthy in body, mind, and spirit. Um, so how does our team work towards this big transformative goal? So our team uses a dissemination and implementation science approach where we're really seeking to understand these food system problems and inequities and then create solutions. So we're really working to move science and evidence-based research into real world solutions that have practical and real world use. So essentially we're seeking to move from this problem state to the solution state. So today um, we're gonna give you two specific examples of how we've done this through technology and show you how we've leveraged um, technology toward nutrition equity. So with that, um, I'm gonna pop just back over to our poll results. Um, so I think we can, awesome, <laughs> thanks Rachel, uh, share those out. Um, so it looks like we have um, quite a wide variety of areas of work. Um, so all, all areas in this poll are related to the tools that we're gonna share with you today. So it looks like um, this seminar will be very relevant to the work of many of you here today. So that's great. Um, well, thank you for participating, and um, with that, I'm very excited to pass it over to Callie um, to dive into one of our tools. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm going to be presenting a bit back of background on our newest tool called FM Engage, which is short for Farmers Market Engagement. And this tool is um, a product of collaboration with us researchers here at the Sweatland Center and um, then our community partners um, and statewide partners at Produce Perks Midwest and the Ohio SNAP Ed program. And like Katie said, um, we want to house these um, tools in what the problem was that we were aiming to address. And so this tool was really built from previous research that the Sweatland Center had done um, that showed that 45%, so almost half of SNAP users with access to produce perks at both farmers markets and grocery stores near their home were not using this program. If you're unfamiliar with Produce Perks, it is an Ohio-based nutrition incentive program that essentially doubles people's budgets for fresh and healthy food. So with every $1 that someone on SNAP spends on fresh um, fruits and vegetables, they receive an additional dollar to be used for fruits and vegetables um, up to about $25. So despite everyone having access to it that's on SNAP, it's really underutilized um, and not really known about. And when people learn about it, they're really excited about it, but don't necessarily know how to, um, how to start using it. So our solution then was to create FM Engage, a tool to help people engage with their farmers markets in their local community. So the goal of FM Engage was to encourage integration of farmers markets into the food shopping routines of SNAP consumers. Um, and we used a collaborative, iterative, and community engaged development process. And this will be a theme throughout the entire presentation why we chose this collaborative and community engaged approach. And I wanna start explaining why we did that um, with this fun image here where we can see that the sidewalk is a design and a pathway that someone else made. But in reality, that doesn't always match what users experience, what people actually want and what they use on a daily basis. So we wanted to make sure that the tools that we are creating in this space match people's actual experience and will not only um, be what they want, but hopefully help them. And so 
the reason that we took this community engaged and collaborative approach is because we didn't want to design something like this sidewalk here that wasn't used and didn't actually match people's experience. So one way that we did this was through something called human center design, which is basically a community engaged approach in the technology um, field. And this is, as you can see, an iterative process. There are three main phases that I'll walk through, starting with inspiration phase, ideation and implementation. Um, so in this um, inspiration phase, this is really how we got started and developed our ideas. And like I mentioned, our problem was really that produce perks, you can see this booth here at a farmer's market, it's underutilized, especially at farmer's market. So that was the problem we wanted to address. And the people that we wanted to help serve were SNAP users, specifically people with children. And um, the needs that we were hoping that the FM Engage would address um, were helping create something that allowed for information about how to access farmers markets and how to use produce perks. All of that could be found in one place. So how we did that, that is the second phase here in the ideation. So we had many iterations of testing and learning what this tool will look like. Um, so we developed um, two different versions of FM Engage um, in order to figure out what we wanted the end result to look like. And so as we were determining the design, um, we had two different ideas. We didn't, we were sure really what to go with. We created um, this game type version and then a more shopping um, centered version. And in order to figure out what people wanted, we talked with them. We asked them what they wanted and what they thought about these two designs. And then we moved forward with one design. And I really want to highlight the iterative process that this was because every time we made a decision, we then talked with people and got their feedback, which then informed the next decision, ultimately, hopefully creating a design that they wanted and um, helps meet those needs. Again, thinking back to that um, sidewalk versus the path carved in the grass, we wanted to make sure that things were were um, aligned. And then the last stage is the implementation. So measuring and learning iterations. Um, and this is something that we are currently in the process of right now. We, um, after our last round of interviews with our first version of FM Engage, um, we took their feedback and now we're creating a second version, which is very exciting. Um, we just contracted out with the developers. Um, and so that is ongoing work and we plan um, to pilot FM Engage version 2.0 at select farmers markets across the state. Um, and we have hopes of launching this tool statewide, hopefully um, this spring or summer, we'll see what happens. Um, and before I hand it off to Jillian um, to go over the PSC Ready, I do wanna share some screenshots of what FM Engage looks like so you can have some context of what we developed. Um, this is the first version that we developed. So this may change as we're creating a second version, like I said, but as you can see here in our home screen, you've got many bubbles of different farmers markets. Um, we only started with a few, so that's why there's just a handful of bubbles here. Um, so once you select on a market, you can see all of their information, their hours, and um, I'll go through these tabs. So vendors, you can see which vendors are at the market, what accepts SNAP, what they're selling. You can also check out their events um, and um, add things to your calendar so that you can become more involved at your farmers markets. Um, and something that we're very excited about is this likely available inventory so people can become more prepared heading into their farmers market experience. You can add things to your shopping list. And then when you're at the market, um, you can pull up your grocery um, list and check things off. Um, so that is some of the, some of the features, um, and again, this may change and hopefully continue to improve. Um, so now I will hand it off to Jillian to share the second tool that we've created. Thank you so much, Callie. Um, so yes, I'll be introducing the second tool, which is the PSE Ready, which stands for Policy Systems and Environmental Readiness Assessment and Decision Instruments. And as Darcy kind of alluded to, um, this tool really came out of a very long-standing collaborative research partnership between the Sweatland Center 
and Ohio SNAP Ed with this vision of really engaging community nutrition practitioners in healthy eating interventions within this PSE or policy systems and environmental space, kind of going beyond their current direct education initiatives. But creating and maintaining uh, PSC interventions can be challenging for practitioners um, because one, communities are not identical and they often do not have the same capacity and readiness for these types of interventions. Um, and that's really where the PSC Ready comes in and is situated within um, what we call our solution space here at the Swellen Center. So the PSC Ready is a planning tool um, that helps community nutrition practitioners tailor their intervention planning to the different readiness and capacity levels of their communities or places in which they work. The web-based tool um, offers this tailored guidance through five assessments that assess um, the intervention readiness in farmers markets, healthy eating and childcare, healthy food retail, farm to school, and food pantries. And we're currently in the very, very final stages of uploading our next assessment, um, the PSC area K through 12 schools onto the website. So for those unfamiliar, uh, this is a screenshot of our homepage and you can always access it through www.pseready.org. But during this presentation, you can also access it through this QR code. Um, and the actual website was launched in 2019, um, and it was included also in the National SNAP Ed Toolkit. So currently, the assessments which tailor that guidance are only available to practitioners within the state of Ohio. Um, but anyone is able to access this website as well as our resource bank and kind of our filtering of national, state, and county level data that can aid in community nutrition work um, more broadly. But um, in line with kind of our inclusion to National SNAP Ed Toolkit, we are actively seeking out to expand this tool into other states as well. So if you are interested in having the full capacity of the website, um, please reach out to one of us, um, specifically Katie Poppy, um, so you can learn more and gather some more information. So here um, you can see an, what an assessment looks like to a practitioner who might be trying to assess their community's readiness for a K through 12 assessment or intervention. And in this assessment, you see we have some themes up at the top as well as indicators or questions kind of layered down at the bottom. And this assessment can be taken as both an individual or as an individual practitioner inviting their collaborators to also take this assessment um, and forming a team. So as a practitioner or a team member, you can answer these questions on this Leichter scale, which is essentially assessing readiness from not at all um, to extremely. And what our website does is it takes all of these answers, whether on an individual or a team, and it generates three next step recommendations for action. So here's an example of what those recommendations could look like if you are a practitioner. So each actual recommendation is associated with some narrative text as well as some related resources to help the practitioner, the community nutrition practitioner, achieve their goals. So on the next slide, um, even though we have this list of related resources in each of the recommendations, um, we also have all of those resources uploaded in a resource bank, which is briefly shown right here. Um, but ultimately, you can search for helpful resources by either your PSE area or your topic, category, or title. So what's really important to share in terms of our collaborative research process um, is how these assessments are formed. So there's a five-phase community engagement process in order to make each one. Um, the first phase is the qualitative study in which we interview SNAP-eligible community residents, as well as community nutrition practitioners who are working on the ground in the certain PSC area that we are exploring. Next, um, we take all of this interview data and we analyze it in order to create a list of themes and potential indicators to go on the assessment. So as you can see, um, the theme is in this circle, practitioner capacity and resources, and the indicators or questions here are listed under the assessment. Next, um, we meet with experts within that certain PSC area or field in order to rank and sort which themes and questions are most important, maybe not relevant to implementation. 
Our fourth phase comes back to us as researchers where we take all of that feedback, edit kind of the website in the sense of updating the assessment as well as writing up the recommendation text. And finally, we pilot test this. So we come back to experts or community, community nutrition practitioners in the field, and they essentially test the validity of the website as well as the usability of the website. And then it ultimately gets published into becoming the PSC Ready. So before I wrap up here today, um, I just want to kind of review what this experience looks like for both practitioners who are working within their communities, as well as leadership who might be overseeing a variety of practitioners, either in a state or a region. So a practitioner might take an assessment with a team or by themselves in order to either start an intervention, uh, maintain one, or make one sustainable. There's a variety of reasons why you can start and take one. You can also retake an assessment if you're feeling like something has changed either in the funding or the partnerships that might change your community readiness. So you can always retake an assessment to get three new generated recommendations. And those recommendations are going to be coming at that community level. So however the practitioner is answering the questions, those are the kind of data that's going to be generated. On the flip side, on um, a leadership perspective, um, if they're working with a series of practitioners, um, this, this output can really be used as a collaborative discussion tool to see where their practitioners are at, in addition to kind of where they should be going or might want to be going in the future. And although we didn't really get into in depth into what kind of we track on the back end of the website, um, leaders have the ability to access county and state level data. For example, they can see what recommendation was most recommended um, to their practitioners in a certain area, as well as a quantitative readiness score that can be tracked over time in their regions. So um, even though I didn't go into that as much in depth today, um, I am very open to answering any questions that you might have about the tool overall or this process. Um, but for now, I'm going to um, give it over to Dr. Darcy Friedman um, to facilitate the panel questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jillian and Callie, for an excellent sort of nutshell summary of a, of a lot of um, steps um, that were involved. And of course, we could talk a lot more about those. But what we felt was a better way for you to learn more about the PSE Ready and uh, FM Engage and this whole process of integrating technology into nutrition equity work um, was through a panel conversation. So I'm going to now turn it over to our panel for a series of questions. If there is a burning question that you have and you don't want to forget, you can put it in the chat and we will be um, having open Q&A at the end. So let's start off by talking about the roles of partnerships and community engagement and the development of these tools. So Owusu, we know that community engagement is a key ingredient in this work, as we heard from both Callie and Jillian. Can you level set for us by defining what you mean by community engagement in this uh, technology development space? Thank you so much, Darcy. So um, as a center, community engagement is one of the three cores of what we do. And when we say community engagement, it is a process that incorporates input from people who the research would impact and involve such people or groups or as equal partners throughout the research process. So at Swellen, we make every effort to bring the right people to the table, um, and we do engage them in all stages of our work, including the problem identification. So as you heard, like, how did we even get here in developing these tools? These were things that were brought up through our partnership with both Ohio SNAP-Ed, ProduceSpec, and the communities that we work with. We also engage them in the design the data collection, the analysis, and another important piece is translating the evidence that we get from this research into something that is practical and digestible for our population. And the PSC Ready and FM Engage that you heard about today are two examples of how we've translated our research into digestible um, tools. Also, research have shown that community engagement is fundamental when you think about translation. So translation research into something that is practical that people can use, community engagement is fundamental. And for our FM Engage tool, as you heard, this all began because of some findings from our earlier research where we found that about 45% of people who were receiving SNAP and were eligible to use nutrition incentives weren't because they had limited information about it. So in our approach, we 
did involve families with children that were receiving SNAP because they are ultimately the end users. We also engage farmers, market managers, because they, without their help, this tool is not going to be efficient. It will just be as Googling any information on the website. So that's how we engage our partners in this process. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Awusua. And Julian, can you share a little bit more about what community engagement looks like in the development of the PSE Ready? Um, and what do you think are some of the benefits to using a community engage approach in that process? Yeah, certainly. So um, we define community engagement as really working with a range of community members in both the development and the maintenance of the tool. So first, as I kind of mentioned in that qualitative study phase, um, we do interview SNAP eligible community members, as well as on the ground community nutrition practitioners and experts within that PSC area field. Um, and we really talk about their experience and their expertise. And that interview content is then directly translated into the content that actually goes on the assessment, whether that be the themes or the questions or the importance of each theme in question. Um, so they really provide the backbone of that content. And then there's this kind of continual back and forth of <laughs> providing, oh, sorry, of providing um, that assessment and getting feedback to really perfect it. And then additionally, this tool is maintained um, continuously and it's built alongside our partners at SNAP Ed OSU. Um, and that collaboration can look differently. So it can be, you know, recommending types of resources to go on the site. Um, it can be giving us feedback on the text of recommendations, the feasibility of recommendations, and then also the sort of areas that we investigate. Um, so for example, both the food pantry and the K through 12 setting were directly um, discussed within our partner conversations as being a need within the community. Um, and we really tried to address that need. So to kind of sum it up, um, there's this collaborative back and forth with community members as well as our partners. And I really, really like um, Callie's image where she provided um, the, feet, the um, footpath versus the cement. Um, and I think one of the benefits of kind of doing this collaborative community-based approach is that we're really trying to make the PSC Ready a tool where we're building that sidewalk along the footpath in the sense that we're creating something that people want and need and use um, in the community. So I think that's probably our, our biggest benefit is, is kind of fulfilling that need. Great, great. Thank you so much, um, Jillian. And I think, you know, what's unique as a Sweatland Center, we do work that's very much in the neighborhoods directly in the Cleveland area. And then what you're seeing in this study is community engagement where we're looking at an entire state or even with FM Engage, looking at an entire country. So of course, community engagement looks really different depending on that scope. Megan, as a PSE specialist with a statewide view, what are some of the benefits of the researcher practitioner partnership that we've had um, in the PSE Ready and FM Engage projects based on your experience with, um, within the OSU SNAP-Ed program? Oh, thank you, Darcy. Um, so the benefits really are endless. Um, we at OSU SNAP Ed are really grateful for this partnership with the Sweatland Center. As a practitioner, it's very difficult to have internal capacity for things like research, design, the collection methods, analysis, evaluation, um, you know, all these things that the, the research team is doing. And we as practitioners, um, you know, just like I said, don't really have the internal capacity to do that. And so being able to take all of that information um, and then turn it into something valuable and something meaningful to share with stakeholders is really beneficial to get that from the research team. Um, and then on the practitioner side, we are able to provide the context regarding things like practical application and the use of the tools in the field, as well as identify barriers oftentimes before they even arise. Um, so providing feedback and being able to um, help the research team design that the best product for success. So we communicate openly and frequently with the team um, and back and forth with each other, kind of what Jillian was referring to earlier which really makes the um, partnership mutually beneficial and maximizes our capacity to reach our goals as a team. Um, 
so for example, one of the times that we were able to do that to benefit the project um, was we were in the process of um, trying to recruit um, conduct focus groups for the, to inform the new food pantry area and the K through 12 areas of the PSE Ready website. And um, the research team had developed a tool, or I'm sorry, a flyer to recruit community participants for the focus groups. And looking at it as practitioners, we felt that the flyer had like a very academic look. It had, you know, the Case Western Reserve uh, University logo on it, which um, really we didn't feel like would attract members of our target audience, especially in local communities, because Case Western Reserve for a community that is very far south or something like that, just it, I don't know if, if the community who would, you know, have, um, who would think that that was like, relevant to them if they're not familiar with the, the university. And so we suggested some of the language on the flyers were re revised and um, there was some space included for some personalization on the flyer so that people could kind of cre create some local relevance, like putting the county name of where we're recruiting in. Um, what's, there was, um, we also requested that there was more specific information provided regarding incentives and some things like that. So the changes that we um, gave feedback on, they might have seemed minor, but we know that recruiting for focus groups is hard enough. And so we wanted to give ourselves the best chance of um, attracting our target audience to seeing those flyers and reaching out for more information. Um, we also provided some feedback regarding the process that the research team had developed for um, having participants call, and then they needed to leave a message, they would get a uh, phone call returned, answer their screening questions, and then schedule an appointment to complete the, their hour-long interview. And so we felt that that back-and-forth nature was just very difficult for someone in our target audience or anyone to follow through um, and complete that many steps. Um, and so we recommended the participants be able to do the screening questions and then go straight into the interview when appropriate. Um, so that was just like an example that well, one of the times where our, as practitioners, we were able to give the research team feedback to kind of create um, a better system for our target audience to benefit from. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. So we're going to shift a little bit um, to focus and consider the process of developing the two tools and the impact that they've had on end users so far. So Callie, from your experiences, what were the most challenging and the most rewarding um, uh, uh, aspects of translating the research findings, as we saw sort of that problem space into this solution space in the format of the FM Engage technology? Yeah, so part of our job as researchers for FM Engage has been translating the input that we've received from staff users and market managers in our interviews into actionable, actionable items um, for the software designers to build out. And that has been both rewarding and challenging. Ms. Marilyn put in the chat that a lot of decisions are made beforehand before you communicate with people. So. It was, it was nice to hear people's perspective and really fun to hear all the great ideas that people had about features that I would never have thought about, even simple things like making sure address links were hyperlinked to Google Maps and Apple Maps. Um, but it is challenging because there are some areas that didn't receive consensus from all the users and we weren't really sure how to move forward with that. Um, you know, um, we never really reached consensus about some some features like electronic or e-tokens for SNAP and Produce Park. So ultimately that is not a feature in FM Engage. Um, and I do wanna highlight that this is iterative work and it requires building relationships, collecting data and feedback over a long time. Um, so it's not a static research brief. It is a platform that has to be updated and maintained. And there's a lot of gears that need to move in order to operate FM Engage and keep it running. So that does take a lot of time and energy, um, but hopefully because it is community engaged, we hope that this is all worth it. We hope that we are building an app that really needs meets the needs um, of um, the end users and it's actually desired. Um, so that is the really re rewarding work. Great, thank you. Um, and so Megan, 
from your perspective of working with SNAP-Ed staff across the state of Ohio, how has the reception of PSE Ready been among this group um, who have been who are doing PSE work in local communities, rural communities, urban communities across our state? And could you give us an example of how practitioners have used the PSE Ready um, in their work or with their partners? Sure. So our um, staff, when we have done trainings and things like this and workshops to train our staff on how to use the PSE Ready tool, um, the reception of the, them receiving this information was has been really well in, in using the tool. Um, they have referred to it as like easy to use um, and like user friendly. Uh, they really appreciated that they were able to put information in and then get information out. Um, they felt that it was very actionable and provided um, guidance and as, as, as well as like concrete resources for them to use and work with their partners. So our um, staff have been really appreciative of the tool um, and having that as a resource to bring to PSE interventions in their communities. So one of the examples that I'm going to give of one of um, of how our staff have used the the PSE Ready is um, an example that's pretty comprehensive because I'll, I'll share how they used the um, the PSE Ready multiple times um, and for different reasons. And so the this example is a five county collaborative. So it's in the northwest corner of Ohio. Um, it's Williams, Defiance, um, Henry, Fulton, and Paulding counties, and the the SNAP Ed staff there work together on a farm to school ECE, which is early childhood education, um, farm to school PSE intervention at local Head Start sites in partnership with their um, local community action commission agency. So um, the, what they do as a collaborative is they, um, the farm to school they follow the farm to school curricula in the um, early childhood education center um, setting. They have do like the menu planning with the staff there and make sure that healthy food items are incorporated and in following the food items that are being discussed in the curriculum and taught in the curriculum. Um, they have community gardens outside and um, they have indoor hydroponic towers in classrooms. Um, and then they also have local procurement. So they're reaching to the local sources to buy things like um, milk, apples, potatoes, things like that that are locally um, available. So um, to start, I would say that the, they have used the PSE Ready. They have found it helpful that um, for their, as a new SNAP-Ed staff stepping into their role, they were able to use the PSE Ready tool to kind of orient themselves to this PSE because this collaborative has been going on, I would say, for several years. Um, and so as new staff, SNAP Ed staff have come on board, they've been able to use it to kind of orient themselves to the PSE that was already occurring. Um, in addition to using it for changes in community context. So for example, um, when COVID happened, it, they were not able to be on site, everything was virtual. And so they, of course, hit a roadblock in being able to do the the, um, the gardening and things like that, that were more of that on site. Um, and so they use the tool, to, that's when they kind of turned towards the local procurement aspect of the farm to school because they had not been doing that prior to that. Um, and so that helped them move forward in their PSE. And then through all of COVID, they experienced um, some changes in partner turnover at their partner site. So they were able to then um, take the assessment as a group or as a team, onboard their new um, partner, the new staff at their partner agency, and use it as a tool really to just convene themselves and go through the assessment and, um, you know, rather than the staff individually having to try to explain what's going on, you know, the tool really did that for them. And so the tool, the, when the assessment, at, you know, they went through the questions and got the recommendations and results at the end of the assessment, they were really able to um, 
provide actionable steps for moving forward. And since that partner was a part of that process, she really had ownership in, in helping to move it forward and understanding really where they were um, at in the in the process. So it was really helpful to um, keep them moving forward in several situations. So um, I think that was just one example. <laughs> Thank you. That's such a good example of this idea of we know one size doesn't fit all with PSEs, but I think what you highlight the value of the PSE ready that context changes, capacity changes. And as those things change, the PSE will change. So early, you know, uh, healthy farm to school in an early childhood setting is going to look differently in the context of COVID and you know, the ability to come back to a tool to sort of recalibrate and identify opportunities to um, adapt as you're moving forward. So Callie, you had mentioned that um, you hoped that uh, FM Engage would have value to the community and doing some of your interviews and feedback sessions, um, what has been the reception for uh, among the different end users? So SNAP uh, families with children, receiving SNAP as well as um, farmers market managers. Yeah, um, yeah, so our goal, thinking back to the problem space and the solution space, our goal with FM Engage was to help solve the problem of nutrition incentive awareness and farmers market barriers. And piecing together all of the feedback and the design phase from that iterative process, we really weren't sure how people seeing FM Engage all together how they were going how that was going to be received but we've been really pleasantly surprised with just how positive the feedback has been from all parties involved um even our partners included so people have told us um snap users have told us that they're surprised that this tool doesn't exist already that someone didn't come out with this um a long time ago and one of my favorite um, pieces of feedback is someone said that our tool is like Google, but better. And that is exactly what we were hoping that this would just be one, um, one source of information for everything that you'd need to feel confident going to the farmer's market and using those nutrition incentives. Um, and similarly, market managers they have really enjoyed FM Engage. They, they want to engage with their customers and they want to share up-to-date information and get people to the market. And they've told us that having, you know, the inventory list could help um, prepare customers and they wouldn't have to receive phone calls all the time about what's available and, you know, is this really what's happening at the market today? So this is really encouraging feedback and we hope that this means that this tool will be widely adopted once we're ready to launch it statewide and beyond. Great, great, thank you. Um, so kind of moving into the, our last set of questions, around, you know, we started off with nutrition equity as, as this key transformational goal to the work of having freedom, agency, and dignity in food traditions resulting in holistic health among people and communities. So Megan, can you talk about how PSE Ready, um, in your perspective, is, is helping to promote nutrition equity in, in Ohio communities? Yeah, Darcy. So I'm going to answer this in two ways. Um, first, I would say that the PSE Ready is designed to change existing PSEs that foster inequities to increase access um, to healthy foods. And by changing, in, or I'm sorry, by engaging um, SNAP eligible households in the design of the tool, we hope that it will help to remove some of the barriers to nutrition equity. So the PSE Ready uses an equity lens to offer um, tailored recommendations and resources for these healthy eating PSE um, interventions and, and next steps. So the tool, um, as has been discussed through this uh, seminar, the tool is really created um, with community engagement to unite the voices considering the diverse community, the diversity in communities. And the benefit of the PSE Ready is that it takes individual perspectives and responses in this assessment tool from a team and creates one community voice. So this can especially be helpful in communities where there's dominance, competitiveness, or pop in populations who are underrepresented. However, with that being said, um, it will it still depends on the stakeholders and the community partners um, to determine how to take action once the recommendations are generated by the tool. So it's our responsibility as practitioners to ensure that we're creating an equitable approach. 
Um, we can't just rely on a tool to do that for us. So in every step of the way, when we're intervening, we need to be intentional and diligent and mindful of equity. So yes, the tool was developed with the equity lens, but again, as practitioners, we need to be um, bring that mindfulness to our approaches and communities. And as uh, Dr. Friedman said earlier, um, that one size doesn't fit all. And so as practitioners, we may we know that we need to um, consider these things and that our community, um, we may know things as practitioners and about our community that this, the tool doesn't necessarily measure. And so we need to be mindful of that. And um, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to address that. So um, we can't, again, be dependent or rely on a tool to make sure that our work is equitable. Every one of us at every level needs to carry that responsibility. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And, you know, we hear about, um, you know, artificial intelligence and the design of various algorithms that are coming out all over the place, whether in your electronic health record or your Google search, and the bias that can be embedded in those algorithms. And I think the community engaged approach hopefully helped to reduce some of those biases. But I think your point is so key that um, the, at the end of the day, there are people who are going to use that and, and they may also have additional biases or additional um, things that additional resources they're going to need in order to act on that information. So I, I think you make such a good point about the, um, you know, a tool will not, it's not going to solve all the problems. Um, so hopefully the tool can be helpful, but practitioners need to be prepared to respond um, in the community. So lastly, I'll turn it over to Awusawa. From your perspective, how do you think um, FM Engage could promote nutrition equity when it's launched later this year? Thanks, Darcy. Um, so um, we know that access to healthy food is not equitable. And Ms. Marilyn correctly noted in the chat that transportation and people not knowing how to prepare foods that they get from the farmer's market are two barriers. And we do feel like those are modifiable barriers, right? And when you think about FM Engage, well, if you don't have transportation and you don't know when the market is open, that even make it even more complicated. So one way that FM Engage is going to help is that we are providing information about the market, what time they are open, what food is available. And so you don't just have to like get on a bus and go there and they are closed, right? Market managers can also message you if you subscribe to their market. And so you can know that, oh, today maybe it's rained, so we are not, we are not going to open. That information we feel will be key in deciding like what time and even like when would you get transportation to go to the market. In terms of how to prepare what to eat, we are also incorporating celebrate your plates in FM Engage. So our goal is that at least once a month, subscribers are going to get message about like how to prepare some of the food that is available in the market that they subscribe to. So if there is like a for that, for that month, there is this particular food that is likely available. We are going to be sending that information. So hopefully that will also modify that barrier of not knowing how to prepare the food. And eventually we hope that that would um, modify some of the barriers to healthy foods and improve healthy diet among families, especially with families with children receiving SNAP. Great. Thank you so much to everybody. And I know we're really nearing the end and I can talk, ask you all more questions, but I wanted to reserve the last uh, six minutes here and longer if people want to stay, but for any questions from the um, group um, and to our panelists. Would anybody like to ask a question? While we're waiting for a question, um, I will uh, maybe put on the spot, our, I see um, Ana Claudia here, from your perspective, um, you know, working statewide and, and helping a state. I mean, I think it's, Miss Marilyn is bringing up so many points around community engagement that are, that are relevant um, everywhere. And, I will say at the same time, community engagement, when we're talking about statewide, I mean, there's no way we could literally be in every single community across the state of 88 counties in Ohio. And we've been very, very purposeful 
to engage rural and urban communities in every step of the way, because we know that the experiences are very different in those contexts. But from your perspective, Ana Claudia, what do you think the, the value of this has been for um, you know, the statewide work around uh, PSE implementation in, in all of these different 88 counties in our state? Well, um, yes, hello everyone, good morning. I think, I think the value is immeasurable um, as, as I think Megan was sharing and, and you were saying Darcy, the, it, having this very strong research group uh, and a very strong practitioners uh, group uh, collaborating uh, and integrating the community feedback uh, into, into these collaborations uh, has helped has helped immensely in elevating PSC interventions in in, in SNAP-Ed. I, um, you know, five six years ago, we had we had, didn't know how to even start PSC interventions in SNAP-Ed. It was something that that was uh, landed in our laps, and and uh, I think this collaboration has really helped us not only um, elevate the amount of uh, implementations and PSCs, but also. Um, measure and, and very being very mindful about it. I, I love what Megan said about we are all responsible and a tool is not going to really um, solve all the issues. We and every step of the way need to make sure that we are we're looking and, 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 and including the voices of those that uh, we are to serve. So yeah, it's yeah, it's been it's been a really um, wonderful experience and, and it's really helped snap ed. Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's been such an honor to work together. I uh, I, I think that the, the value of this work, um, I can just say as a researcher, it's also a different way to work with communities. So we're largely working with the people who are then working with the people on the ground. So this work is not a boots on the ground project. It's working with people who are then working with the people with the boots on the ground. And so it's it's been an interesting way to think about what collaboration looks like in that space. Um, and at the same time, I think just being fully transparent that neither of these tools are the solution alone, right? These are um, one piece to a very complicated puzzle um, even with FM Engage, we have a long history. Miss Marilyn, Rachel, others in this group were involved in our FreshLink Ambassador Program, which was a peer-to-peer -peer model of raising awareness about farmers markets. It was a fabulous model. Um, and yet we found that it was not easy to disseminate. It was not easy to get implemented in the real world. And so in this FM Engage, we're sort of looking to um, technology as another partner in the solution of the same problem, um, that people aren't necessarily aware of what's available. And I'll remember, I'll just kind of close on this, one of my very first experiences, and this was actually when I was a PhD student in Nashville, Tennessee, I was at a market and a woman came up and she looked and she thought that the red tomatoes were apples and the yellow squash were bananas. And she got closer to the market and then she's talking on the phone to her friend. She's like, this is the worst market ever. They don't even have apples and bananas here. And that is something that FM Engage could communicate um, to say, these are what you can expect and bananas are not on the list. If you're looking for bananas, don't waste your time. We know transportation is a barrier. We know it's hard to get out. This is not the place to come or when maybe you love strawberries, we also hear that um, a lot of the fruits are really popular, but they sell out fast. So that's why we have that um, the ability for our market manager to say, hey, come early if you want to get this, because they probably will sell out. And we don't want to waste your time coming here. And that's the one thing you really wanted to get. So, you know, it's not the whole solution, but uh, one piece of the puzzle. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our partners. We even see um, some of our alumni staff who are on this call. Um, thank you all. This has been a long time um, process and I think a really rewarding experience. So with that, I will turn it over to um, uh, Rachel who will be closing us out. Thanks everyone. I just wanted to close by saying um, on our next slide here, we have 
a QR code if you want to stay connected and see what's happening at the Sweatland Center. I think that takes you to our link tree where you can hear about more events, but also our other research. Um, find out our social medias, follow us there. We will be recording. We have been recording this and we'll post it online on our YouTube channel. And we'll be sending out a message to let folks know when that's up. So have a great day and thank you. Take care.